This episode, I'm joined once again by Aaron French to discuss the work and mysticism of Jakob Burma. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support the podcast and keep everything running, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Aaron French, thanks once again for joining me on Medics podcast. Thanks for having me back again. We are going to loosely, uh, but mostly focusing on the work of Jakob Burma, who was a German philosopher, a Christian mystic, uh, and arguably, though I'm sure not everyone would agree with this, uh, a Lutheran theologian. But that's you know certainly up for debate, considering his sort of controversial status. Um, considered very you know original in his day known for certain books but mostly i think for a book called aurora um lots of scandals around him in the day as well and this is he he is uh born 1575 dies uh 1624 so you were pointing out before we started recording this year in november will be the 400th anniversary of his death so yeah aaron Jakob burma uh, what interests you so much about his work, and when did you sort of first, you know, find you had this interest? Uh, well, just being interested, I suppose, in the history of Western esotericism, it's rather impossible to ignore uh, someone like him. But he's also, I think, as we'll talk about here, he's a bit, um, he's a bit difficult to to penetrate and to absorb how he's important. You know, it, perhaps it's becoming more easier. These days, as more people are focusing on him uh, more and in, and in different ways, but but even then, he's so like um, inscrutable. I suppose, like, even the way he talks and thinks and expresses his ideas, they're like fully in line with uh, esoteric uh, different forms of esotericism. Like in my case, this Christian esoteric Christianity, Christian esotericism in the Central European lands, but but not only there, but I was focusing on there. Uh, he's he's extremely important, and he's like in some ways a, a, a founding figure in in the modern stream of that. So he was always in the background in these later like occult and esoteric thinkers that I I was interested in. But um, you know, you have to uh, it, it takes a kind of journey from their time, like the time of the Theosophists, for example, who were all interested in Burma, uh, like to journey from their time back to Jakob Burma's time and to read what what he was saying. It's really interesting but it's a kind of a, a journey because it's a different context uh and yet the ideas are are, are very similar so i mean it's, it's not necessarily like a philosophical continuity i suppose but it is they're definitely working with similar religious themes which i would just which are in this category that we're using of, of esotericism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so one of the things that's intriguing about burma and you i mentioned it now i mean some of the things you sent me to sort of uh, read and also watch about Burma. One of the things that was emphasized is, I mean, his his education, he's not necessarily an educated man. I mean, he has a very, very basic education, which for his day probably would have been rare anyway. And then after this mystical, mystical divine experience, which isn't probably what people will imagine, he then begins to educate himself more via finding text. But he's, you know, he's before that, he's just an average, seems like he's pretty much an average Joe, mm -hmm. really. He's an average Johan. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's interesting about that point that he's self-educated, because again, if I'm with those modern, you know, can, moderns, like when I'm looking at the esotericists that I'm writing about in, like, in my academic research are usually end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. But even there, Many of them were also self-educated. Mm -hmm. So this is a, an interesting part. They're autodidacts, you know, like Manly P. Hall is like a great example of that. Like he's, he wrote these massive books. Uh, many like Masonic uh, historians also were and it's just self-taught somehow <laughs> and self-trained and how to research. And like, of course, that's a definitely was and has been a criticism against esotericism by the academic establishment for a long time, especially in the 20th century. Now, now it's a bit people are opening up to it's just a different way of doing it. Maybe they have good, you know, there's like some flexibility emerging these days. Uh, but the self-educated part is important. And in fact, he was trained as a as a shoemaker, as a as a cobbler. And so that's a that that's is a form of education. I mean, that's what's important. It's just not this like gymnasium literary 
mm-hmm. whatever, learn some Latin stuff. He was trained in a, in a, in a trade, you know, as a kind mm-hmm. of trade a craftsman, uh, so to speak. So, yeah. And then, um, so this theme of being an autodidact is also one you find in esoteric thinkers. I mean, you could argue that some of the academic training, I think academics know this, some of them to a certain extent. And when some of these like post-structuralists, I think we're aware of this, that the academic training, in fact, blocks you from inspiration and and certain kind of newness, you know, mm-hmm. apprehending a new kind of a, a new kind of idea, a new theory, like the training is set up to uh, you know, persuade you not to do that the whole time. So, but if you're an autodidact, you don't care. <laughs> you're just going to go for it always, you know. And so you do arrive in new, even philosophical, spiritual landscapes because of that. I think so. Like the post-structuralists, I think we're uh, to some extent aware of that and just trying to like shoot out beyond well, the, the way they were trained. But of course, they still had the training originally, where as Jakob Burma had none of this kind of training. No well, theolo- he wasn't a theologian either or anything like that, you know. Yeah, and this and the, yeah, but that's what I was going to add in. I mean, this is something we mentioned in our. A start Christianity course, which we can plug, but um, mm-hmm. that someone else to bring in, I mean, who's who's along these lines in a way, uh, Meister Eckhart is someone who, you know, completely gets this uh, formal uh, Dominican training and is completely, you know, is writing manuals for Dominicans to read. Um, and what you mentioned there about this uh, is like two paths of what happens when you have an experience or have an understanding that you've come to, which butts heads with formal training. So Meister Eckhart, we, you know, as we historically know, though it's a bit overblown, is all constantly at odds trying to find ways to have his own personal understanding be uh in line with official dogmatic teaching. Whereas someone such as Jacob Burma, well that that you know you don't become as apprehensive. But of course, as we know, he does get in some hot water as as is imagined. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's really interesting to think about, okay, what is he trying to do? You know, like, what is, if, if a person like this, like Jakob Burma, and maybe we should I'll talk mm-hmm. about his life a little bit here too, but mm-hmm. his motivation is purely, uh, it's twofold. It's, it's on the one hand, it's purely s- spiritual or religious. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he feels, um, in other words, it's not to get any kind of position or, or anything or not even to to uphold necessarily some kind of uh, a dogma or, or or save souls. I don't even think that's like what it, it's like purely his own uh, his, his own like uh, need mm-hmm. based on uh, his spirituality. That's like one half. And on the other half, he has these visions, you know, so so these two elements of his life are his motivation, which um yeah, it's just a different kind of motivation. The thing is, you do then want, like all, like many mystics do want to then communicate these experiences. And then you do get, I don't know, like followers. Like even ja- Jakob Burma had followers, even in his time. And this is like another subject of like, okay, this is a reason why many esotericists were also not uh, taken seriously by the quote-unquote establishment. Because it's like, oh, what if they have these followers in quotes? So it's like, well, they're just trying to get... Then it seems like it's an ego trip, or it can be even framed that way, mm-hmm. something like this, you know. But um, just to say a little bit about him, more about his background, and we'll come to these uh, these mystical experiences that he had. Um, so, as you mentioned, he was born uh, right in this period where the the Reformation and the Counter Reformation was taking place. So there was uh, a lot of conflict over religious ideas. He was born in a small village. Um, or, uh, but then he moved to a town called Gorlitz, which is now where he's known. You know, if you go to Gorlitz, that's where his uh, legacy is, so to speak, in his museum and so on. He bought a house there. He got married there and had children. Then he set up his own uh, cobbler's shop. And that's like what his life was going to be. You know, he he was trained to uh, he had two options to become a farmer or, or or not. And so he said not. And then you can't then become a theologian necessarily. If you, you know, if those are your options to be a farmer or not. So then he became shoemaker. Uh, but in Gorlitz, though, I think this is part of the important part of his story, because this was a very interesting place at the time. It was right on the border between modern day Germany and modern day Poland. So you had the uh, Lutheran inf- influence on the in the in the in the states of Saxony, which is what is now Saxony and and, and Brandenburg in Germany, and on the other side you had the Habsburg uh, Bohemia. I mean, it was essentially part of Bohemia at the time, but it was like right on the border between these groups. 
and even in Bohemia, you had uh, Calvinist groups that were like popping up and and being suppressed and so on. So you know, he's like right in between these two things. Another interesting part about this area, it's um, it's uh, also known as uh, Lusatia, and there's a group of um, it's like it's in Germany at this point, but there's a group of uh of indigenous Slavic uh, peoples also that are from this area, and they they are still around. They're called the Sorbs, and they they speak a language which is more close closely related to like Czech or or Slovak or Polish or something, and they have customs that look like they're coming out of a Slavic context, you know, like traditional uh, folk kind of uh, things. And and they're still in that area in Gorlitz and so on and still preserve some of their language. So so this is also part of like this context. He's in a very like um, hybrid kind of context between quote unquote East and West in, in East and West Europe or, or something at this point. And then the other reason why it's important that he's there is because um, Bohemia and Prague, this is the time of Rudolf II in Prague, who was uh, Prague was basically like esoteric Disneyland at this point. So you had all sorts of alchemists and Kabbalists and magicians and so on and astrologers there. Mm. And because uh, Gorlitz was positioned where it was, you, it was kind of like a nexus of all of these influences. You had these kind of ca- Lutheran, Catholic, but also Kabbalistic and, and alchemical influences and these like traditional Slavic, even kind of cultural influences. So it's a real like a uh, real mixed uh, environment that he that he was encountering. And you have to think, too, that this is not a trained person, as we've been talking about. So if you take a, 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 I don't know, a small town boy or something like that and stick him in that kind of environment, you know, he's very open. Mm. So I think he was quite receptive to all of these things and responded in a receptive, open way, not with uh, cynical criticism, which is the way a trained person would normally respond to it, is what I mean. He had this kind of open reaction to it and then responded uh, emotionally, you know, w- with his life and with his with his spirituality. Um, yeah, so that's so he was there just to continue here a little bit more. He was there as a cobbler, and then he was always. And we can get into this later if you want about like what's mythical about his life and what's real. But he supposedly was always kind of sensitive, had spiritual experiences of, of a kind, like even when he was young. But then, uh, famously, in 1600, he had this big mystical experience, and it's first reported by his biographer. Well, the the full account that we have was reported by his biographer, Abraham von uh, Frankenberg. Barma also talks about it, but you have like different accounts of what it is. But but generally speaking, he's in his cobbler's shop and he sees the light reflected off of a metal dish. Mm. And uh, in response to this seemingly mundane occurrence, observation, he has uh, like a breakthrough in terms of like the nature of reality, the nature of light and darkness and, and so on. And he he himself later claimed that this lasted like an hour. He then like wandered out outside and was like looking at the grass and the light and having this like profound download, <laughs> essentially. Um, yeah, and then he then he he didn't do it. He just like lived with this experience, apparently according to the biography, for twelve years. And then in twelve after twelve years, he he produced his first work, which wasn't actually published per se, but it was. He, I mean, he wrote it, and this is the book Aurora. And as far as I know, I don't think it was published. The only thing, the only like officially published book in his lifetime was The Way to Christ. Mm-hmm. Could be wrong here, but I mean, he did write these things, and they were kind of circulated, you know. Mm. And this book Aurora, for example, was somehow the Lutheran minister in Gorlitz got his hands on a copy of it and uh, freaked out. Mm-hmm. And with the support of the city council, they ordered Burma to stop writing anymore on the grounds of heresy. Mm-hmm. And so he did. We should add in there as well on the grounds of heresy that, you know, it's not, it's around this time, quite literally, Mm -hmm. that uh, one one Giordano Bruno has just been burned at the stake for heresy as well. So this is, uh, it's not a small, it's not a small deal. Right. So it was a hot topic and they were looking (laughs) and he, he could, uh, the punishments were, would have been known, (laughs) you know, to, if you continue along that road. And so he did stop, but he didn't stop uh, for good. He kept writing, I think, in secret, and he completed a second book in 1619. And then this is right around the time when the Thirty Years' War starts. And to, just to wrap up this section, that he, this is the Reformation, Counter Reformation. Now he's in the Thirty Years' War with these groups fighting. And so this was a uh, horrible uh, one, one of the most horrible wars in European history. And so he's like witnessing all of this 
And it's interesting that, as I mentioned, he's responding to it in this emotional, like philosophical way, open way. And so he seems like somehow, I think he got it, you know, he seems uh, well positioned to to suddenly grasp this c- conflict between polarities. Mm. You know, that's the way he took it into his spirituality, into his philosophy, and the symbolism of, of light and darkness then, or polarity, becomes super strong in his uh, cosmology and his system. So one thing I was going to ask, though, I mean, clearly there's not going to be too many direct influences because his mystical writing comes from. I think, I think I'm right in thinking the only book he read for a long time was literally just the Bible. So the, mm-hmm. the influence is just going to be scriptural until later on. But was he, uh, you, you know, was he a notably spiritual person prior to these uh, experiences? Yeah, I mean, according to the yeah, I mean, in the sense of like um, the small town Johann. <laughs> is a is a spiritual type of guy, religious guy. Mm. He must have been reading the Bible in German now that we're thinking about this, because this is after Luther. So Luther has now done his deed, and so the Bible can be read in German. Um, the other thing about jo- Jakob Berma is he was one of the first to... Hegel called him the first German philosopher because, yeah, he's reading the German Bible, and then he writes his philosophy in German. So the uh, establishment people would have been writing it all in Latin. So he's one of the first ones to now writing it in German. So Hegel refers to him at some point. Other people do as well as like the German philosopher, because like in the line, in the same way as Luther, we could say he's now writing it in German mm. uh, rather than in Latin. But so he was influenced by Luther and Luther was, of course, uh, known to be a kind of anti-mystic. Uh, but Luther did have a sympathy for Bernard of Clairvaux, actually. So he wasn't like fully against it. He was kind of in the middle, I suppose. Uh, But some other influences, like, because he's just reading the Bible, then he has his experiences, and then he's writing, and he's not citing what he's, any sources, really, in this. He's just, like, expressing himself, you know. It is hard to track down, like, where is he getting this, you know? And this is, again, the same with later esotericists, like, just off the top of my head, if I rattle off the modern ones, like, Manly P. Hall, well, even, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Elvis Levy, Manly P. Hall, Albert Pike, Rudolf Steiner. I mean, all these people have all of these things that they've quote unquote written. Mm. But even, you know, Blavatsky does cite a lot of her work, actually. Maybe we give her some credit. Maybe God knows what she's citing, but it's interesting that <laughs> she does cite a lot of her, her, a lot of her sources, you know. Mm. But at the same time, she's saying, this part I got from this guy who's wrong. <laughs> but here from this spiritual being, I get this other information, which is right, you know. So she's still pulling on some non textual. Mm way of, of doing it well the, just to draw on that actually i mean a lot of those writers even though we don't know where they got it from they will have their uh signifier for the place or the the thing so mm-hmm. where where it apparently came from so with uh uh blavatsky it's the the masters right that is it's the tibetan masters with steiner yeah. it'd be the akashic chronicles mm-hmm. uh right. someone like gurdjieff maybe he found some scrolls in the desert which mm-hmm. no one has ever found etc etc there isn't mm-hmm. any you know burma would he just say God? Well, this is interesting. Actually, I'm glad you're you're asking this because <laughs> there's a part of this I wanted to talk about, which is sort of like a mythical part, you know, but I, I like it. I think it's cool and interesting because like, so the academics try to track down the historians. Where is he getting his ideas from, you know? And with sticking with that context, it's clear that he likely, well, he, it is clear that he was influenced. It's just not clear how much by the Kabbalah. And mm-hmm. he, he references the Kabbalah at a few points. Uh, so we know he like knows about it. And how could he not know about it? He's, of course he knows about it. So, uh, it's just not, he's like saying, and in the Zohar and then this and then makes a footnote. You know, he just doesn't do it that way, but he does mention the Kabbalah by name a few times. We know he also used concepts from Paracelsus mm-hmm. a lot. Um, and people around him were, uh, were connected to other people at the time who were like, you know, proto-Christian theosophists or like Lutheran mystics of a kind. So like he he also read uh, and from his one of his supporters was was also in correspondence with this person, Valentin Weigel, who was another um, like Lutheran mystic, you know, kind of a, we get into this later, the pan-sophist, like a Sophianist within this Lutheran context. And also Casper uh, Schwankfeld, he was another one of these reformer mystical, they kind of set up like Bruderschaft or like a Gemeinde. So you get like 
someone with this really intense spirit in ger- the German context, I mean, you get like someone with a really intense German or not German, sorry, an intense spiritual spirituality or inner spiritual experience. And then they get like a group around them, mm-hmm. you know, and sometimes they operate in secret, not so much for esoteric purposes, but sometimes, but for the reasons that you were talking about, because like you get in a lot of trouble, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so these are a part of his influence. And another person, and here's the, the fun mythical part is that he probably knew about the sermons of Johannes Tauler. And there's this other book called the Theologia Germanica, which is like a mystical treatise from the Middle Ages. It's just called it's the German theology in the English translation. Or so it's like, yeah. And it, but it, this is thought to have been written by uh, like a member of this Teutonic order. Mm. And so around the same time as I mean, Johann, Johannes Tauler was important, and he was uh, connected to this. Teutonic order uh, a certain to a certain extent like the people around it at this time and so there's a famous uh, here's the mythical part which the theosophists do connect Burma to this that in the Ger- in the tradition of like German Christian esoteric Christian esotericism uh, G- German Christian esotericism or Christian theosophy uh, comes to be known as this later there's this um, uh, story or like legend about someone a quasi legend about someone called the friend of God from Oberland. And in German, it's uh, Der Gottesfreund from Oberland. And this is a m- like mysterious figure in the history of German mysticism uh, in the Middle Ages. And he was associated with a group who called themselves the friends of God. Just mm-hmm. that was it. And uh, this figure, this person calling himself the friend of God from Oberland, from Upperland in English, I suppose. Uh, this person was involved in um uh in basically like not like teaching or working with johannes Tauler on his own mystical uh expression and his own mystical teachings like refining them for him and also like correcting him according to the story where he was going astray at certain points in his like his sermons and his beliefs you know his own personal beliefs and uh so Tauler and these gottesfreunde they are uh working together at this period, according to this story about, and their whole, like, you know, their whole, uh, story or their whole, uh, mission is to promote this idea that, uh, there's an inner connection between the, the believer and God. And that this is actually the, this relationship is actually more important than external practices. And they even set up a kind of monastery in the, when the wilderness around the town of Strasbourg. So this is all happening uh, in that area. But I have one quote here uh, about this, and this is from uh, Franz Hartmann, so famous uh, theosophist, and he has a book called The Life of a Christian Philosopher. So I'm just going to read this little short passage from this. Uh, so he, uh, Burma, had another unusual experience when he worked in the shoemaker shop, and an unknown stranger entered and asked Burma to come outside. When he went out in the street, the stranger looked into his eyes and said, Jakob, You are now little, but you will become a great man, and the world will wonder about you. Be pious, live in the fear of God, and honor his word. Especially do I admonish you to read the Bible. Herein you will find comfort and consolation, and you will have to suffer a great deal of trouble, trouble, poverty, and persecution. Nevertheless, do not fear, but remain firm. God loves you and is gracious to you. End quote. So, it's interesting because within this context of this German theosophy, this there's a Rosicrucian connection here, which is what I want to point out. That even s- many of these people have a story like this. Like Johannes Tauler has his mysterious figure that he meets, mm-hmm. the, friend, the friend of God. You, Burma has, if we, if we believe these legends, has this mm-hmm. kind of a story. Uh, Steiner has this story about meeting a, a, a quote-unquote master, these Rosicrucian masters. So he's... Whether I like, I have not been able to like, I don't have, you know, to look to find out where these stories coming from. I suppose if someone knows, they could give us more information about this. But the Theosophists did bring him into this kind of tradition, and it's a tradition of uh, like hidden Rosicrucian masters contacting people, uh, in order to, you know, in order to uh, like continue the the project, continue the mission. And uh, the Theosophists, of course, are, would take this Rosicrucian stream back to these Teutonic Knights, back to the Templars and this kind of other Christianity. So I just wanted to mention that story because it's kind of interesting that uh, this story about meeting a master that 
according to Franz Harman, at least, Burma also had some experience like this. Mm-hmm. So to jump to jump into his thought, his work, um, mm-hmm. and I guess from these, uh, from really from this first um, mystical experience that he has with the the jar and the light, the it seems that the primary problem that he's seeing and tackling uh or the primary thing he wants to maybe resolve or is resolved in a way or is attempted to be resolved is the question of theodicy right why why is there so much evil and suffering in the world which of course is going to be rife in his own life with respect to the war and probably not the best living standards i believe he's pretty poor for a while has to move to a different district and things like this so this this is would you say this is the central question of his work of how to reconcile evil with a loving god yeah i I would say so it's it's the main pro it's one of the main it is the main project but i don't know there's like another thing that he's definitely big keen on and that is like merging with i mean they're connected so like to merge with god is connected to the problem of evil so he's he's definitely really uh interested in um in in this like what i would call it is this chemical idea of the chemical wedding like this uh in the roads speaking from within the roads of uh philosophies like he's definitely interested in that for sure but he's also interested in the problem of evil the theodicy prop issue but they're kind of both related for him and, and he he relates them in very interesting ways by coming up with all sorts of new basically philosophical ideas and making a system <laughs> to to resolve these things in order to bring those two things uh together but uh yeah as you mentioned like this problem of good and evil it's definitely uh in response to uh i think what he's seeing around him you know but it's also i i imagine it's it's in response to his own like he has a book that one of the books i'd recommend people to check out is called confessions so he he does uh talk about his own like there's this external social context of the war but he has his own struggles uh about this so it's it's definitely that's a motivating factor like how to uh how to um stop the like the evil will the self what he calls like the self will within himself like this is this is his main goal is i have to uh like the the lowercase s self <laughs> the will of this self uh is the thing that is responsible for evil and so we all have this um but and this will of this self will he relates to like the lucifer he takes it back in the fall of the rebel angels that this is like uh, the beginning of this uh, idea, and so that the individual must uh, have to submit this smaller will to uh, to a higher will, and in the process of doing that, which is not easy, obviously, <laughs> uh, and so, but if you can do it, uh, this obliterates the smaller s self will, uh, lowercase s, and the, but in this for the sake of this <laughs> capital S self, the higher this higher self, but it, the process of doing that obliterates the, the the smaller self uh but it doesn't just mean you become the higher self like the way he talks about it is that this actually it makes something new so the, the process of doing that gives is the moment of rebirth and you you then are like a new being uh what he calls the unified union with god so in german it's die einige einigung so you are like this single unified it gives birth to this single unified being um mm-hmm. So it isn't necess- I think why he does he spends so much time thinking in this way because it isn't just like you just bow down and submit or something or you remove yourself and replace it with with it isn't and replace it with God or something God's will it's not exactly that like you do do that but then that creates like a new being a new a new creature and uh yeah so it's this inner struggle which with he's doing within himself and talking about but I think he sees it playing out in in the conflicts in his around in the world around him as well can can that uh, once after post unification when you become this being can that small s self return or are you perfect evermore no yeah i think that's the end of it but i, but I think the struggle continues like it, i mean that's a good question cuz it's not really clear but he does say that when you if you really do it um yeah then you're um well, this is a good question because, like, for example, he do- he talks about in the book of Rev- Revelation, you know, in these like the end times that human beings will have done that, you know, that so that they will be. And the one thing I should bring in here is is how he's talking about it is in terms of polarity again. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I mean, for him personally, like, he, he doesn't claim to have done that, even though he's writing all of these books, you know, so, but, so he claims to, of course, have some kind of illuminations and, but then he also claims to just be continuously locked in this struggle. So I suppose for him, maybe it's true that it's just the struggle the whole time, but there, but there is like an objective, you know, and it is also possible. Um, like I have this one quote I wanted to read here from his confessions where he, he's talking about this and he says, um, this is a quote from, from Burma about this inner battle. He says, I am a sinful and mortal man as well as thou, and I must every day and every hour grapple, struggle, and fight with the devil who afflicts me in my corrupted, lost nature, in the wrathful power which is in my flesh, and in all men continually. Suddenly I get the better of him. Suddenly he is too hard for me. Yet notwithstanding, he has not overcome or conquered me, though he often gets the advantage over me. If he buffets me, then I must retire and give back. But the divine power helps me again. Then he also receives a blow and often loses the day in the fight. But when he is overcome, when the heavenly gate opens in my spirit, and then the spirit sees the divine and heavenly being, not externally beyond the body, but in the wellspring of the heart. Mm. I mean, he does kind of claim that uh, that's what happens in this moment, you know, because leading up to this big mystical experience he had, he was struggling over this theodicy problem inwardly, you know, and so he, so in this sense, uh, he, the, the, gate, the heavenly gates opened. I mean, he put up, does put it that way in another place. Mm -hmm. But I think he's then also back to the struggle. So, it, Well, I th so this is why I asked that question about whether or not I could return, because from my own readings, it seems like Burma's, uh, Burma's philosophy and theology, if we wanted to call it that, is very um, processual. Like it's everything right. is ongoing. It reminded me really of like an Ouroboros, right? Like you're within this thing that is ever ongoing and both – both sides of that ongoing process are always needed to keep it going. And there's not going to be this, uh, which is kind of very much against the dogmatics of Christianity, which is very fond of like hard stops at some, at certain points. That's why Oregon got in trouble as well. But, um, really what I'm, I'm talking about there is, you know, when he has this first mystical experience with the light going into this sort of dark vase, he has this realization that the light can only exist because of the dark or evil can we only can understand evil because we understand good and vice versa and so both of these things and sort of always needed for any understanding of either of them to be at all and so it almost seems for Burma like the problem of evil doesn't really get a resolution you know it's not like we're going to get rid of evil because there's this um there's a basically an internal requirement within good for there to be evil at all um and so that's where it gets a bit complicated but am, am mm -hmm. i somewhat right on, on those yeah lines? no you are for sure and there's more to say about this too about uh the, it definitely strikes me as well as a kind of process mm. you know process theology or something like but it's also dialectical uh and that's why you know even hegel is interested in him that this the notion of polarities and 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 the and dialectical uh, uh creation or dialectical processes like ongoing you know mm. Uh, th that's also distinct in the German uh, tradition of, of philosophy and romanticism and so on as well. So it's interesting that he is also working with that. And he, he does take this position that uh, evil is not created by God, but that it's um, it's part of what you just said, that it's part of this dialectical process, that the one is needed. And in, in it gets really um, unusual when you read the way he tries to like explain this stuff or it mm -hmm. kind of spins your head around you know because he's he says like uh this the dark wo the world of darkness or evil or wrath or whatever is required for the, the the world of light but it's out of those two worlds that this third world uh appears or this third being appears and so it's it's a kind it is a kind of process but there is like a result you know in the being out of it but i do think that you're right that the struggle uh, also uh, continues, but it's within this this uh, twofold into the three that um, that allows for like you know he says this is how the Trinity is reflected in nature for, as well you know so it's mm -hmm. the, those th that process is essential for the the kind of like the union this chemical marriage with God but it, but you have to uh, struggle through that process through what I just described to come to this higher mm -hmm. uh, understanding or this higher position you know so 
where does Jesus fit into this? Because you mentioned the Trinity, and so, you know, two yeah. into the third. Seems like that might be the position that Christ is fulfilling, because, once again, my, if, I'm, if my memory serves me well, one of Burma's more controversial ideas, really, with respect to this Trinity idea, is that God the Father isn't really, like, fully God. That That's not Burma's words, but he isn't. Like, it's Jesus Christ is the, the more central figure, like, which... I don't know if this is right, so this is just me speaking, but Burma's appreciation of the Trinity appeared to me as if it was not, you know, there's the classic, uh, Jesus is the, Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is all God. There didn't seem to be this equal, this equal relationship for Burma in that they eventually get to Christ, who is, as you said, like, well, you didn't say, but there is this point of resolution. And is that where Christ comes in? Yeah. And this point of re- resolution is, you know, the, is the Christ in you? Mm. Um, so, like, I don't think he would say that, but I'm sure people would could could say that. Like, I'm, he has his he he has the Trinity. He has uh, all of these elements involved, <laughs> but he definitely, like, all the Pietists and these German mystics, this inner Christ component is massive. So, so it does receive definitely more emphasis. But I would say more where he gets into trouble, which we can come to, is his the role of Sophia, mm-hmm. uh, which suddenly does shift it from your normal three to a four, mm. sort of. And we, we can come back to that. But w- one thing just to talk about this uh, this threefold thing, how he's how he's looking at it. He, he he does he has this concept of the three principles. Like this number three is important for him, and he has the three worlds. Uh, he also like has this uh, rereading of the book of Genesis that I just wanted to talk about. So, so he, in his reading of the book of Genesis, you have Adam, uh, the first human, who which is like the reflection of the divine, mm. created though of the quintessence or the prima materia. Mm. So you'll see him drawing on these Paracelsian and alchemical ideas here as, as well. So Adam is composed of the quintessence, uh, but. He, through his own self will this lower case s self will he rejects uh his he, through the use of that will the desiring of that will he rejects his union with god mm-hmm. and at this point uh this is what brahma calls this the first fall at this point sophia is taken from him so in other words this original adam being was uh androgynous in that it was the sophia the wisdom was in there mm-hmm. But when he when he has this first fall, the Sophia is is taken away, and God replaces it with Eva. And but it's so, and this is a woman, but it's it's still one being <laughs> at this point. Okay. Uh, I'm with you. Th- okay, but then they taste the fruit of knowledge, <laughs> yeah. and this is the second fall, and then they become two separate gendered beings mm-hmm. at this point. And this is the problem of duality. This is where uh, evil is brought in, and of course. Like there's this um, idea that Carl Jung talked about a lot about the binarius, which is this so-called spirit of du- this kind of dragon spirit of duality, uh, and this other alchemists in this tradition also talked about the binarius as being like the the when you bring in this duality, this was this is how this is evil in the world. So you have to resolve this in order to get rid of evil, and and Burma is on the same page. And so when you go through this process that I mentioned about uh, the struggling to give up to the higher will, and then something else is reborn. What is reborn is the Christ part of you. But it's only that whole process is only possible with the Sophia, with wisdom. Mm. So in fact, this third position that you arrive in is the reunification of the polarity, the two yeah. genders, the uh, the Christ and the Sophia are married, uh, again, within you. Um, and he does say, like when he, when, as I mentioned in the book of Revelation, he says that humans will regain their bodies without gender. Uh, at this point, because it's this process of the 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 break into the gendered. You find this in a lot of Gnostic books as well. I mean, this is kind of Gnostic in a certain, I guess, in a way. What I'm talking about here, mm. uh, but I don't know that Burma was thinking about it in, uh, in that way, or if he had access to those ideas. But so the 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 polarity of the two genders is the is the origin of evil. The reunification of the two genders in the form of Christ and Sophia is the reconciliation of that. It's a full a full cycle all the way yeah. around. Now, what's interesting yeah. about that cycle is, you know, unlike, um, you know, if we were to say Catholic theology, which is faith faith based, um, 
uh, faith and works, sorry. Oh, and then if you were to go through to you know something like Calvin, which is like double predestination, you're already chosen, um, and all of these different theologies which have uh, a theolo- like a very complex theological understanding as to what the role of God is with regards to one's individual salvation, almost seems for Burma like that whole thing has been... I don't want to say severed, but I'll use that word because it's what came to mind. You know, severed away, and it's like the onus is on you to to use what is available for this reunification. I'm, you know, I'm asking. So we we have, you know, we have the inner Christ, but all the while I'm like, where's God? You know, where's God in this? Yeah, <clears throat> well, and it's a good question because there is a kind of back. One could see a sort of God taking the back seat <laughs> in all of this, and not only does the Christ take sit in the front seat more, but also Sophia is probably in the driver's seat. So you do have this shifting uh, going on, which is why I think that there are these problems of heresy sometimes and so on. And so this tradition of the Sophia, though, like all of this stuff, like using the Kabbalah, using alchemy, using astrology, which he's using all of these. uh, Again, it's interesting to think about him as being, you know, from the small village and encountering all these ideas and then just like putting them into the Bible that he was reading. You know, he's not trained to keep them out, per se. He's just, like, going for it with all of these things. So I think that those ideas are uh, behind it, uh, like, underlying it. You know, and and that does then change uh, the form of it from opposed to if you're just learning systematic theology, you know, or something like that, you would mm-hmm. uh, you would get this you would get this model, you know, you get this form. And he's doing a much more, like, um, yeah, it's more art- artsy, <laughs> in some way, you know, he's he's kind of painting with it, but he's also thinking, you know, so it's like, this is, again, part of this German uh, history of German philosophy quality of this, like art and philosophy, it's kind of holistic, you know, uh, thing that it's known for. So there's a, yeah, there's, he, he's doing philosophy and to some extent, but he's also doing a kind of creative activity, I think, mm-hmm. like a kind of art. Um, just to, in that, when I was talking about this um, Adam, Two Falls of Adam, he says, this is an interesting quote from Burma, he says, uh, uh, Adam, in her, Adam reflected the Trinity in paradise, but he fell asleep. He slept as one, but woke as two. He slept to eternal being and woke to the elemental existence in which he came to know good and evil. So again, he's talking about he had the Sophia at first, but uh, then he he fell asleep, he used his will, in other words, uh, fell asleep to his own divine, to the divine, and then woke up as two separate beings this is what it says but what's really intriguing about that the more i think about it i mean this notion of the two folds right so the first, first the beginning the beginnings of everything of man as a entirely unified androgynous well sorry not man uh an androgynous perfect mm-hmm. being human yeah. inc- mm-hmm. human that includes sophia and the whole of the non duality to become the duality within it is is within Eden, would be within Eden as I understand it. Then there is the first fall. But what's interesting there is Adam and Eve are still within Eden. So we, you know, so because Eden you're seen as losing, uh, what's it called? Um, it, you know, you can speak one-on-one with one-on-one and walk, walk in the garden with God, but I can't remember. Right. There is a theological right. name for that mm-hmm. uh, divine something. I can't remember what it's mm-hmm. called. But we lost something bigger before that but what's interesting is we fell and we were still still within eden with that polarity which pre- yeah. like supposes <laughs> some fairly spicy theology with regards to it. if the very notion you know you're talking about jung with what's it called the dragon yeah, the binarius binarius yeah. so mm-hmm. I, I don't know I, I don't know that concept too well but it seems like the, the very notion of polarity fragmentation mm-hmm. duality itself is the you know, is the evil, is the problem in itself. So, you yeah. know, having this split that's still within Eden is a very strange, yeah, strange thing. It is quite strange. And he even says something like what was happening there was that then God was like testing them again. Like, okay, you did it. You did it once. And then I took away the Sophia. But will you do it again? You know, like we, and we, so we, we, we got a first. <laughs> we did actually get a set. We did get a second chance. Something like that. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> but then they did it again, and then yeah. Then so get... uh, just to draw on the Sophia thing, I, I mean, you said that with the Gnosticism thing, it's probably going to be very difficult to really trace 
whether or not mm-hmm. you read it, read any of that, I guess, outside of any explicit statements. Because Sophia, I think for for many people, Sophia is understood as um, you know the the snuck the snuck in spark of Sophia, which is allows us to return outside of the demiurge, the Gnostic yeah. demiurge world. Mm-hmm. What was Burma's relationship with with the world? Did he have that kind of understanding? You know, that sort of Gnostic, also Neoplatonic, the world really is not where we should be, or was what what's going on there? No, I don't I don't think so actually. I mean I think he's seeing it more in terms of like um I mean it is a fallen state and a fallen nature, you know. I mean he holds to that, but it's more about like returning. You find this in a lot of these esoteric Christianity uh systems of, of belief or, or ideas that you have to return to the state prior to the fall. Mm. So it's it's not about getting out of, of this world, but in, it's in a weird way, first of all, transforming yourself. I mean, this is the alchemical part. He, he even refers to the Christ as the philosopher's stone uh, in some places because it transmutes humans from this lower state in, back into their perfect human state. Mm. And the same is actually true of the world. So it's more a process. This is why I'm into the Manichaean elements of this. Sometimes I go into that area because... The way the Manichaean Christianity is read in this context, or way it's described, which is different from the, to some extent, different from the actual historical movement around Mani, uh, but it's about this idea of transforming evil into good. So it's a, it's a tr- it is a processual activity, and it's that you transform evil into good from lower state into higher state. Uh, the world comes with you, though. <laughs> you know, you don't leave uh, this world, and in fact, you find some really extreme. Uh, interesting a little bit later by people who are more than likely also influenced by burma or people who who had been influenced by burma in france in central europe you find in these like in martinism and and pasquale and the elu cohen and these like um these uh yeah like these these other forms of christian mysticism that are a bit later there you find a, a huge emphasis on this return to the prelapsarian state and that's like their main activity but they're doing it through you know ritual magic mm-hmm. And so on, but they also have these ideas about, uh, yeah, like uh, reckoning the the world. So that so they think that their ritual magic not only transforms them, but it's going to crack the world and uh, and um, transmute it. You know, start the process of, of transmutation, the alchemical process. You know, which is a, pro- a process of death and rebirth. So the world dies first, and and so on. So I guess that's I'm just all that to say it's a bit different. I think than just to escape in like a Neoplatonic sense, like escape the the hell. There isn't. There's this like transformative aspect aspect to it as well. Mm-hmm. So one more aspect to bring in just with his philosophy is uh, the the Ungrund, I believe it's yeah. pronounced. But what is this mm-hmm. uh, strange idea? Well, if I could say, I'll come to that because it's related to Sophia. Maybe I could just say okay. one more thing about the Sophia. So the in, in these in this, I'm just going to call it Christian theosophy, but scholars usually say Christian theosophy starts with Jakob Burma, technically speaking. But there were like these friend of God idea that I mentioned. And there, there were other, and the Christian Kabbalah elements, there were the other things around that could be connected to it, in my opinion. Uh, and Sophia is there as part of it. Like when the Christian Kabbalists, sometimes Sophia and the Shkina the, in the, in, are connected uh, in this way. And Shkina in, in Judaism is the female side of God, but it's the way you reach God. It's the wisdom. So when uh, the high priest would go into the temple to communicate uh, with with uh, with Yahweh, it would be through the holy. The Shkina is what would appear above the ark. So that's the uh, that's like the medium through which one a person can. The wisdom is the medium through which someone can actually reach to the divine to that level. And so you you find this idea of being used with Sophia. A lot as well, and and some of these uh, other like so. There's another tradition, Pan Sophism, is kind of related to this. But there, there's an overlap here between Christian Theosophy and Pan Sophism. But the Sophia just takes on the central role as the way to God. And you had some of these uh, some of these thinkers like um, th- these are all a little bit after Burma, but not much. And, but in fact, they are like his legacy. Like they were figuring out ways to evoke. The Sophia, like as a spiritual being, you know, to to how to emerge, how to merge themselves with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like, and even Steiner, much later, of course, is is in the same group, and he says, uh, "There's a famous quote from Steiner where he said, it is not the Christ we lack, but the Sophia of Christ that we lack.'" 
And his esoteric Christianity is built on the same idea that you have to somehow regain the Sophia in order to, uh, not that you don't have the Christ, but you're like oblivious of it. You know, you're not conscious of it. So you have to, and this will come to the Ungrund <laughs> with this unconscious thing. Like you, you, you can't know it. You know, you're sort of like Zen Buddhism or something. Like you're, you're already enlightened, but you just don't know it. You're ignorant. But the Sophia somehow is what allows you to become aware of it, you know? Um, and Burma says also that Sophia is the mother in which the father works. <laughs> yeah, so these are all... So the father's within the mother? Yeah, or no, the Sophia is the mother in which... Yeah, something like that. So there's some kind of like reversals going on here. So you could see, I guess, why he's getting into trouble. But this is not just him speaking this way. Like, he's part of a larger... Some of it comes after him, as I said, but this is a kind of part, a larger, uh, uh, I guess, tradition, we would call it. I don't know, like interest in using the Sophia in this way. Yeah. Um, but to go to this idea of the, the Ungrund, uh, what is this? This is like, um, he says he comes to this idea when he has these visionary experiences, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, he calls it uh, the the fathomless, ineffable abyss of divinity. And what he says was, in this experience, I saw and knew the being of all beings. So it's this kind of like, you know, a cosmic abyss or, or mm -hmm. something. But uh, what's interesting about him is he has, he talks about the ground of being, and then there's this uh, groundless. There's the groundless, and there's the ground of being. And it's this groundless, this kind of nothingness, this abyss, you know, that he's that's what the Ungrund is. But, you know, if you were to look at this idea more and track it through people like Schelling and uh, um, von Hardman and then Freud and Jung, I mean, this leads to this idea of the unconscious in a certain sense. Or it's this is like the, you know, the the background of it in a similar. You can watch it developing it, in other words, through like reading Burma. And he it's it's not so different from some from some of like well, the way Jung would uh, maybe talk about it. But it is like this. uh it's it's the nothingness, but it's uh, it's the abyss of nothingness in which the somethingness in which the somethingness becomes aware it is a something. <laughs> you, in other words, when you look into the abyss, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when you encounter the abyss, the nothingness. Even Heidegger, I guess, a little bit talk is like talking about this in a very different way. But uh, when you encounter the nothingness, the abyss, only in the abyss can you become aware that there is something. Uh, the nothing, the nothing itself is, in other words, reaching uh, for the something. <laughs> and when you read him talking about this, it's it's almost it makes you laugh because of the way he has to say it. It sounds almost like it's kind of wordplay, you know, mm -hmm. or something. Um, I didn't have I didn't bring a, a quote with me, but he when you read it, it's like reading, you know, like a, a like, like a, a complete tautology kind of thing. Something. Like it's just a kind of. Yeah, yeah, cursive, yeah, mm -hmm. cyclical kind of uh, thinking, you know, that just spins your head around in a certain. But I think that's the point, you know. And he, even one place he calls it uh, a kind of a Liebespiel, uh, a play of love. Like he's kind of playing at, with these ideas. Uh, but you, but like for example, Kierkegaard said that the self is a self that relates itself to itself. And for Burma, it's something like this. It's like the self is an eye that sees itself as an eye staring back at itself. Mm. In the in this ungrund, in this in this nothingness, and uh, it, it, he also brings in the, the through this kind of process, this dialectical process. This is how the Trinity is reflected for him also uh, in nature. But the, but the Sophia is also brought in here because he says that this ungrund, this abyss, is only knowable through the Sophia, and he says that the Sophia is the virginal wisdom of the nothing. <laughs> so it's. Uh, the the will of the nothing looks out in search of something. Like he talks a lot about desire and craving. So, I mean, he's speaking abstractly, but you could just make this very literal and concrete that you are the nothing, you know, mm -hmm. this small self will. The nothing looks out in desire in search of something in, uh, in, in light and love. And then it you get a kind of self-revelation uh, in the nothing that there is a something. But then you draw this back to you. And if this could re this could result then in a kind of union, a reconciliation of uh, of the opposites. So he he does talk about this as a kind of Liebespiel, as a, as a love play, but it's um, the nothing knows itself as something, and this leads to like a knowledge of the et eternal or, or something like that. It's pretty complicated. I'm not going to lot pretend like I fully understand yeah. what he's going well, on. Well, I, I think it seems to be. I mean, 
it seems to the same uh inherent paradox seems to be mirrored in his appro- approach of the odyssey right of good and evil of what okay well where does that sort of end sort of thing because you can't have good winning because good can only be defined right like nothing can really come to a complete stop or a complete success or something akin to that idea because if it did so it would cease to exist because it doesn't have the contradistinction which it needs to exist same with being is this sort of recursive thing within which there seems to be nothing but it seems maybe that within that paradox is some truth that he found and that's the only way he could mm-hmm. articulate it maybe for for, right. for for us yeah and i think it's kind of visual in a certain sense it's visual the way he's working with it with the idea of light and dark mm-hmm. you know so he's he's getting a kind of uh visual uh he, he's getting a kind of like a picture of something that he's then attempting to describe I- in words uh, the only other thing I would add about that is he does talk a lot about about freedom. Mm-hmm. So um, this uh, it's sometimes referred to as der Ungrund der Freiheit. So it's it's also in this dialectical process in which um, the free will is uh, the, the true freedom is attained because in this the, the lower self being obliterated by the higher self, giving birth to this new <laughs> Christ Sophia self. This is like the the state of the true state of freedom uh, again. So it's this, it's really similar to like later philosophers, like, like Hegel, for example, just using it in, in a, a very different way. But uh, the freed will is, is this, is the will of God, but it's the, it's your will. It's united with the will of God. So it is a kind of like submission to God's will, you know, but, it, but it isn't that, you know, like he, he goes to great lengths to make it more than that in a certain sense. Okay, <laughs> I'll pretend. Yeah. I'll pretend like I. I pretend like I'm not. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe one question to ask, considering my own sort of befuddlement with that, is like, did you said he had some followers? I think he had like ardent readers who, without which, like monetary support, he probably would have been forgotten. Were there, mm-hmm. like, maybe during his life, probably not during his life, but after his death, did societies or practice build on a communal level? Yeah, well, he had, like, in his, even in Gorlitz, he had people who supported his ideas, but then he had, like, these, I mean, it was the Lutheran pastors who were after him, so that's interesting mm-hmm. to, you know, to think about. So, yeah, the only book, as I mentioned, that I think was published in his life was The Way to Christ, but um, his papers were taken, like, for example, these, this thing with the Lutheran priest and, the, and his supporters in the town, this didn't let up for his whole life. And in fact, the successor of this, of the original pastor who was after him was there and on his deathbed, you know, grilling him <laughs> about these crazy ideas and uh, say, you know, before he was, whether or not he was going to make it, you know, it, mm-hmm. when he, when he died. So they didn't let up uh, on this, <laughs> but uh, his, his papers or some of his papers or something were smuggled because people were fleeing these areas obviously because now there's this war you know so and famously amsterdam became a place where many people fled uh religious persecution so his books some like well some of his legacy ends up in amsterdam but like some people wrote biographies about him and then started publishing his books a lot of these diagrams that you sometimes see with the that are in yaka burma books or if you just you know search his name or something those aren't necessarily by him but by some of these people who uh some of them are but some of them are people who are like illustrating and putting out his works uh, after the fact. So yeah, after the fact, uh, after he, his death, he did um, he did start to attain a much wider readership, and he influenced lots of people. I mean, for example, he uh, I had uh, some interesting ones I wanted to mention here uh, about that. That like so one person he influenced was William Blake. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of see in my opinion, a, a kind of a similarity even there between the two of them. And what is that similarity? Like, <clears throat> they're both uh, very uh, fiery. Like, it's the fire of the spirit. Uh, they have they have, uh, they have, have received something, and they're uh, on fire to, uh, to get it out there. I don't think they've got anything to prove, though. You know what hmm? I mean? I don't think they have anything to prove. Like, they're just, like, right. this thing happened, and now I'm going to write about it, whatever. Right, yeah, they're not trying to like convince you no. or something. Yeah, yeah, they're just they're telling you, you know, they're sh- mm-hmm. they're shouting it out, and they're doing it in a very like uh, 
very vigorous and uh, like intense. It's a kind of intense communication mm. uh, that they're in form of, of expression that they're using. So there are some differences between Blake and Burma, obviously, but there are a lot of uh, similarities. So, and he was influenced by him, but also even like Milton and even Isaac Newton. So, uh, his, his ideas did uh, become uh, much more well known later. And then, as I mentioned, even the Theosophists are then picking him up. Mm-hmm. So you, he continued like right away. He and continuously he was connected to these like esoteric currents. Yeah. Uh, so they were always uh, taking an interest in him. You know, at this point, I'm not exactly sure. What I think he's still a bit, uh, for example, I knew someone who was in Gorlitz and I just brought up Yaku Burma, someone who was from there. I met them somewhere else. And uh, just to see if, oh, is he, do you know who that is? He's, that's Gorlitz. That's, you know, the town of Yaku Burma. And their response is something like, hey, he's kind of a crazy man, kind of a madman, <laughs> you know. So there's, there's still a little bit of like uh, this idea that he was, you know, he's, he's, Kind of, I don't know if crazy is the right word, but like, uh, like, a fool, of, like a fool for Christ. Yeah, something like that. Like he's somehow not not fully with, you know, there's some kind of defect with him or something, you know, something that you can't just like accept him as like, and now he's great. You know, and now we're all going to uh, have uh, him be like part of the town, <laughs> the town uh, uh, be known for it. I'm sure if you go to Gorlitz, yeah, there, there was a museum there and so forth. But it, he was, in a certain sense, he's quite radical in, in for this that because his ideas were so challenging and um yeah and the way that he expressed them it, he's hard he's a, he's a hard individual to uh categorize and to put somewhere you know that uh well, cuz he's 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 shifting I guess, he's like I guess it so shifty help that we only had one book published in his lifetime i mean what were were the others did he make up the others into manuscripts or no, I think he just had, I mean, I think he had lots of writings that were circulated, but I think it was, they were made into manuscripts in Amsterdam, for example, and published uh, elsewhere. He was you the know? first person to do like correspondence courses. For us. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's like secret writings. You also <laughs> find a big tradition of this, you know, going on for a while of just circulation of teachings, mm. you know, that, that had to be in a part of a private circle, you know, but these were the esoteric uh, <laughs> ideas or something. Mm. Yeah, so I mean he has books about like so there his famous most famous book is, is Aurora. There's a book The Confessions that I mentioned and there you get to see him struggling uh to overcome this lower part of this lowercase self this this darkness and to you know reach the the next reach this kind of chemical marriage uh, within himself and to have this revelation and he talks about uh how in some ways that ha- had happened to him. Some of his other books talk about, uh, like, there's some other things we didn't go into here because it's really just a lot. But he has these other, some of his other texts talk about, um, like, there's one book, The Threefold Life, is kind of a, that's an interesting one. And then 40 Questions of the Soul. And some of these, he's, uh, in the book of the Three Principles, as I mentioned. Here, he does some of his, like, rereadings of biblical texts. Like, I mentioned just a little bit of it with this rereading of the fall in the story of Genesis. Uh, but he also works out different types of um, systems. So, like, he has, and some people have argued, like, he might have been inspired by Kabbalah and the Sifiroth and the Tree of Life when he's, but it clearly looks like an alchemical, because he's into astrology. So, he's, so in some of these texts, he is, like, building correspondences between metals and planets and biblical symbolism uh, and things like that. But then adding his own things, like, one of the things, he's always adding this third principle like one of the things he's also known for is um i think adding sulfur to the idea of salt and mercury or that's the other way around like he he's the one the one who puts salt mercury and sulfur together <laughs> as being important you know and and makes a big deal uh, about that and, and talks about and talks about that in, in the kind of alchemical uh way but it's all it's you know it's philosophical he's not like in a laboratory or something he's this is like um he it's a it's just, it's alchemically and uh and astrology is inspiring his like philosophy. It's kind of like his spiritual philosophy, basically. So there's a lot of, of correspondences and a lot of like, um, another thing he talks uh, a lot about that we didn't quite cover is what he calls the seven spirits of God. Mm. And these are like different qualities that, uh, are <laughs> like the means by which God exists or, or is active, uh, in creation, you know, and, and, just to give an example of that, it's things like 
One is like sharpness or dryness or the power of contraction. Another one is sweetness or warmth. Another one is love. And, he, and so he has these, he builds up these qualities and how they interrelate. And it is very much about process and how through these processes of correspondences and interrelation, you know, different elements, different aspects of creation uh, are manifest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which one of those books would you recommend for people to start with for Burma? Yeah, well, you can just go read about the Unground if you want to uh, <laughs> have a, a, your, a, your mind spun around a, a bunch. But uh, if you, also Aurora is a bit difficult, I would say, to... Uh, to, to start with so to be honest i would say like um just look at his dia the diagrams to start there that are associated with the with his writings because there you can at least see visually depicted some of these ideas and start to get a sense about this idea of polarity and dialectic and third principle and three principles and so on but there are the confessions is the other one. You mm -hmm. can find this online actually. So, and this is just him talking about his life and his experiences. So it's also a bit more uh, accessible. And, um, the only, the other one is that the one that what was published in his life, the way to Christ, there's a, a good, um, uh, edition of that by this, I think it's called the classics and Western spirituality series that most people are familiar. I think with that they did, uh, uh, an, issue, an edition of the way to christ and they have some good commentary in there about mm -hmm. uh about about what the idea is in there and, and the other one is there's a smaller book that i quite liked and it's from a series it's an older book but it's called the esoteric masters series can't mm -hmm. remember mm -hmm. who the compiler was but they did a book on burma also which is it's kind of edited abridged compilation of some of his key writings you know mm -hmm. so that one's also i found quite good there's also the documentary film which you recommend yeah er, that's right yeah and there is a documentary now that is um it's in several languages so you, if they have english subtitles and it's uh it's on vimeo it's called the life and legacy of yaka burma and it's uh, a documentary film by lucas Trivalco, mm -hmm. which i'm sure i'm saying his name wrong and i apologize but it's really a it's a really good documentary really good introduction also to get like an overview of of some of these ideas and the other, the last thing I wanted to mention is that because it's this 400th anniversary that you said at the at the beginning here, that I they're actually going to have a new exhibition in Gorlitz uh, this year to commemorate that, and that I think is opening in August. So that's another thing to look out for. All right. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add about Burma that uh, is key, or uh, have we have we wrapped it up? Um, no, I think we did a good job of introducing him. Uh, there's obviously a lot more to talk about and a lot more depth and uh, details and so forth. But I would just say that the more you dig into him, like he's a bit hard to, to begin to start on. But the more you dig into it, the more like reward, rewarding it is, I would say. So there are really good uh, ideas in there, even ideas that are like for a meditative in a meditative sense that they, they really do cause you to think and to and to sort of go into contemplative states. And I think by reading him, you can really also see how important he was for modern esotericism. All right. Well, I'll put the links for the things you mentioned in the description below. But uh, it's a good place to finish up. So Aaron French, once again, thanks very much. Thank you.